it's going to be very interactive. And so one of the first pieces of interaction we're going to have is asking everybody to move into the center aisle. Okay? So you can't leave here today saying we didn't engage you and have you do anything. First thing, smoking, we're asking you to get up and move into the center aisle. Center aisle and front row. <laughs> My name is Gregory Davis, and I'd like to welcome you to Urban Impact at Emerald City Bible Fellowship. Uh, this is an organization that has been um, providing services for families in the Rainier Valley since 1997. The president uh, and pastor of the church is Harvey uh, Drake, and his wife, Andrea Drake, have been at the helm, um, making what you see here uh, a reality. Um, I'm a member of this church, so I'm uh, very happy to welcome you. We have a very important conversation that's going on tonight, and I'm sure you picked up on it, and that's why you're here, Parenting in a Violent World. There are a couple of people that we want to uh, introduce you to who are serving as our um, kind of host organizations. When, uh, after introducing them, um, what I want to do is to hear uh, from each of you to find out who you are, um, what organization you're representing, and why you are here. Um, we'd like you to try to be brief, okay, but as I look around the room, mm, it might be a little tough for some of us, but I'm going to make the request, because um, we want to know who's here um, and why you're here. Uh, but first, I want to just give some a shout out to a young lady who was with the uh, administration on Children and Families, uh, Janice Holt, who is one of the um, host organizations. Let's give her some appreciation. <laughs> um, the other gentleman, and I want to let you know who is here, is Patrick Patterson. And he's, he's here um, representing President Obama's fatherhood clearinghouse. And Patrick is over here, so let's give him some appreciation. <laughs> and of course, our moderator for the evening, uh, Terrence. Lewis, uh, season of life, who's going to be taking over the, the panel process. Let's give um, Terrence some appreciation. So what we'd like to do is just kind of start here and just ask you, um, I'm inclined to hold the mic because I know, but, but no, I'm going to be good. Good trick. Good trick. That's going to be a little too tight. So I'm just going to ask you all to share, share your name, your organization, uh, and why you're here. Uh, my name is Michael Hunter. Our organization is Heart to Heart in Action. And uh, we're here because we've been building uh, relationships um, with other uh, entities in our community that are reaching uh, families. And uh, so that's why I'm here. Let the people see you. Oh, right. I got one applause. All right. All right. <laughs> Hi, my name is Nature Carter Gooding, and I am. Here as a community organizer, and then also too with the CIS network, and we work with young uh, African American girls in the community in the CSA population, and that's commercially sexually exploited children. And so that's why I'm here. Thank you. Good evening, I'm Don Rivers. And hey, I, I coach them in basketball. He was good, that's why he's still alive. Uh, I'm a uh, founder of Inside Out Training and Consulting, and uh, founder of All Players Rock Community Advisory Council, which deals with social justice. And I want you to pray for the two young men that were shot in Olympia. One young man had 10 bullets in his back, and he's alive, and he started to get his lower extremities to move right over, and God started moving. Days and things. So, uh, the other one was shot here. And the bullet tried to burn out the back. So just pray for those young men. My name is Stephen Thomas. I am a, an attorney. I work for the King County Prosecutor Attorney's Office. I work in the domestic violence unit. Victoria Thomas, and I am a PhD student at the University of 
Washington. Um, I'm currently working for a new center just opened, the Center for Communication, Difference, and Equity. And we are partnering with the Boys and the Girls Club here in King County, and we're doing a lot of um, tutoring down there, um, as well as uh, programs. So I'm here to um, give a little more insight of what our children need in this community. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, folks. Uh, my name is Nathan Fox. I'm the
start to think about her. Okay, great, I'm going home. Then I also have a, a five-year-old uh, nephew of my ex-husband's uh, family. I brought home five days old from the hospital. And he's five years old now. I helped him with the doctor now who lives in the community. Also, every day. And so, very passionate. and really hopes to like help prevent them from going down routes that um, aren't you know as good for them. So. Good evening everyone. My name is Monica Matthews and I too am here first and foremost of a, as a mother of a 21 year old black male um, who is a, going into his junior year at Central Washington University and um, watching his friends, some of them die um, some of them be locked up and watch my own son go through his own struggles too and how to best support that. It gets harder the older he gets. And so I'm here because of that. And also I'm the founder and executive director of the Life Enrichment Group. Uh, we have um, programs within several um, Southeast Seattle schools. Young Queens is one of them, personal development program for young ladies, and Know to Grow, which is a college prep program for our young people. So I'm very concerned about this community. I'm from Chicago. I've been here 20 years, residing in the Central District for 10 of them, and in the South End for the other 10. So I'm very concerned about our youth in this community. Thank you. My name is My name is Don, and um, I'm representing myself tonight. Um, I've been involved in this community for for 15 years. This is one of my home churches, um, and. So, you know, I'm an educator at heart. I did that for 30 years. I only taught in urban settings. Um, and I, I'm just here because I, I have heart for this community. Um, I, I'm deeply um, concerned about following issues. And, um, so I'm here because this is an important conversation. Hi everyone, my name is Mahali Pilaris. I am an auntie, community member, and currently a social worker at Child Protective Services. So I'm on the front line knocking on doors, being cut out. Mm -hmm. um, but I care about families. I'm also a grief sister, so my brother was murdered here in Seattle 106. Hi, I'm, good evening. I'm Terry Hayes. I went to the Seattle Human Services Department, but I'm here for me. Mm.
And so um, because of that, I uh, created an agency along with some of the African American sisters that came from dominant agencies called the Cyber Task Force. And we are tasked with educating our community, providing intervention and, and prevention around domestic violence and sexual assault in the churches, schools, um, community settings, on the streets. I'm also here in affiliation with uh, the CIS network, uh, dealing with uh, commercially exploited youth. Uh, and so uh, that's really the work that's going on. I also work in capacity with the um, Seattle Youth Violence Prevention Initiative, running girls groups uh, from Central Seattle, uh, one of our programs, uh, Running Child, uh, which is a culmination of programs that have been running. It's called The Bomb, which is the beauty of my blackness. And that is a program that was designed to help our young ladies uh, understand that they are brilliant, they are beautiful, they are capable. It's also an undercover domestic violence program, sexual assault program, because we, many of us know you cannot go into our community and say, oh, we got this domestic violence program we want you to come to so we can help you help you. Because they're like, really? It don't work with wrong folks. It's definitely not working with our youth. So for me, trying to figure out the language that I could speak that they could hear and they would respond to and be willing to be participants of and come out successful. So we're and going into our second, thanks to Mr. Smalls and the City of Seattle and other folks who are going into our second session. And we're looking to have some uh, great outcomes as our young ladies understand, you know, red flags, boundaries, uh, and, and what they're doing if they are in those situations in which they are. Got it. everybody. Uh, my name is Sean Bias. I'm here in a few different capacities. One as a father uh, of teenagers. And, uh, growing up as a teenager here in Seattle, I remember driving while black, getting pulled over all the time, different things. So uh, our ministry is uh, spiritual blessings.
I'm Olivia Goldsmith. Um, I'm the Seattle Housing Authority. I'm a community builder over at New Holly. Um, this past summer, two of our youth were um, murdered. So I'm in that professional capacity, I'm here um, to find out ways to best support the families that I work with. Uh, personally, um, I have an 18 year old daughter, um, and this past summer she has attended four memorials for her friends. I'm really saddened by that. Um, she's become immune to it. So I'm just trying to find out the ways to both professional and personally. Hi, my name is Jane Kajikan. I work with Felicia, the Seattle Housing Authority. I'm a community builder and maintenance staff. So I'm here to learn and connect so that. Help support the families of Rene Vista. I work at iPhone for many years. So, go ahead, Mom. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Marcia Blitzo, and I'm actually a member here at the Christian Bible Fellowship. It was just happenstance because we have our worship practice on Thursday. And so, I walked in and I was like, wow, there's a lot of people here for worship tonight. Yeah. And then I saw that it was a town hall. So, all the audience specifically come from the town hall. I am new to the Seattle area. I work with Casey Family Programs. And in the cities, uh, or the, the issues and challenges that are happening here in Seattle are also happening in um, Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona. And so I feel as if this is my community, although I'm new. And although I won't be able to stay, I'm sure that there will be some positive and uh, informational um, things that are going to So thank you for being So for those of you who didn't catch the instructions, we want to hear your name. My name is Mark Montero, and uh, I'm a friend of Terrence Lewis. <laughs> Hi, my name is Guy Anthony Carroll. Um, I'm a board member for the RBAC, um, also a member of this church, and, um, of this community. I have an eight-year-old daughter. I've raised two daughters, um, single dad. Um, I'm here because I'm interested to to understand why is it that our government has all this information, documents, and studies for over the years of how our children have had to suffer and endure um, racism and biases in our schools and our communities. And although they have all this information, nothing has truly been done to change anything. And it's like um, folks are kind of getting desensitized. Our children are getting angry because their parents are telling them to do well and to stay strong and, and have faith in, in God, but nonetheless, society hasn't changed. And um, our government seems to support this act of, I don't know, what, what would be the word for it? Um, discrimination, institutionalized discrimination. Um, as a child, I've endured it, and I've overcame it, and I yet endure it. But at the same time, I don't think that our children should have to go through and our government know it. It's not like it's a secret. It's not like they don't have information or data to, I mean, they've done studies. I mean, we've done studies with George Mason University, with um, the Kona Breeders and um, the um, beautiful safe place for you here in Rainbow Beach. I mean, I've seen how they can collect this information, and I've seen how they can utilize this information to make a difference in other communities. But for some reason, all around the United States, our communities are not growing. And they're not profiting. Our children are not overcoming. Or, or the system is not putting things in place for them to become stronger. Or for us to have the tools to necessary to undo what has been done in their lives. And I'm just, I'm like anyone else. I'm just wondering, what is it? What's going on? Are we not, you know, are we not valuable enough as, as a people? That our, and our children are not valuable enough as children of the United States of America, those who they pledge to this flag, and yet they are ignored. Yet they are discriminated against. And yet they still need help. So I just want to know what's going on. Good evening, my name is Zach Davis, and uh, I was invited to request a conference. So just for your information, I just had your first workshop. Okay, you know, all these people here who are representing all these organizations speaking uh, truth. 
Um, my name is Gregory Davis again, and I actually, during the day, work for Casey Family Program. And one of the things we're trying to do is get young people out of foster care. We know that as a result of being in foster care, young people suffer from trauma at twice the rate of U.S. war veterans. And that's kind of the next step to this uh, violence piece. By night, I um, am chair of the Rainier Beach Action Coalition. You heard the brother talk about our back. And one of the things that we're looking to do is bring the restorative justice movement to Rainier Beach um, at the five schools that we have um, so that we have peace circles to impact um, the things that happen in the neighborhood. So thank you very much. Why don't you give yourselves a hand? Appreciate you all being here. A couple of housekeeping things. The bathrooms are out the door to your right. Uh, we also have some sheets that we need you to sign and that they're publicity releases because this is uh, a situation where we are wanting to do photographs and promote it. Uh, we also have some snacks out there, so feel free to get up and take advantage of those. You'll notice at the front table uh, that we were handing out these note cards. And so these are intended for you to write down questions um, that we want to be able to ask the panel. Uh, in fact, uh, can the folks who are here who are on the panel come, come up and take your seat as we prepare for that particular part of the program? Um, the other thing that we want you to do is to use these cards for, is to write down ideas. Okay? And we don't want just any old, any old idea, we want a rich idea that's going to be able to move uh, this issue. Um, so we want to make sure that you do that. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so what we have in store tonight, as you can see, is we have a, a panel um, that is going to be um, talking about their particular experiences around this topic, and then we're going to have an opportunity for audience participation to, to ask the panel uh, questions, to kind of cite your truth, cite your facts uh, that you may know. Uh, and Terrence is going to be leading us through uh, this portion. Uh, I think I kind of covered all the bases, and so what we're going to do now is just um, have uh, Mr. Patterson up here kind of talk about you know, a little bit more why we're here, kind of what the national landscape is that kind of brought uh, this to um, Seattle. So we'll turn it over. Okay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. It's funny that every place that I've gone and I have on nice shoes, they're always on the table. <laughs> now I have on a boot. That's a nice shoe. It's a nice shoe. Uh, my name is Patrick Patterson. I represent a couple things tonight. Um, one is I'm a son, uh, I'm a brother, I'm a nephew, I'm an uncle, and I grew up in South Carolina, which is a little different from Seattle, Washington. Uh, slightly, but I got a home girl here. Orangeburg, okay, it's not going to stay. Um, I grew up in neighborhoods where you either played ball or you got involved in the game. One or the other. And if you did both, you weren't good at either. Um, for me, um, professionally speaking, this is an area of interest because I still have friends to this day that are just getting out of prison. I'm 41. Um, so that's personally who I am. I'm a father of two daughters. My wife and I have been married 18 years. I want them to marry somebody good. Yeah. Are y'all following that? Yeah. 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 I want them to be able to be raised in a neighborhood where they're safe. And so, as a part of our work with the government, I do represent the President's Father and Clearinghouse, and in that capacity, we have the benefit and opportunity to travel the country and work with programs that work with families. Um, is everything fair and equal? No, it's not. Um, is this a place that we can start? Yes, it is. Um, just about two months ago, Terrence was invited to Baltimore, where we had this first conversation about parents getting involved with. It just so happened, truthfully, we planned this meeting probably in January that the Freddie Gray situation had popped off. And so it was a real town hall where we had parents who were really concerned about when they're in the custody of the authorities, they still ain't safe. When they are walking to school where there are crossing guards, these kids still aren't safe. And so it was our first chance to really have a public conversation about what's really going on. Um, because Terrence, and I got to just give Terrence a shot, I've known Terrence probably eight years. Whenever he comes to Washington, D.C., he says, y'all got to come to Washington State. And 
And so he was in Baltimore for that conversation, and he made it point blank, clear. They banging out here too. And that we really need you guys to see and have a part of the conversation. So I want to just publicly appreciate you, Terrence, for being an ambassador. <laughs> so for us, what was um, really noteworthy was that the government, who we've been sending reports, we've been saying this, sometimes they have to see it to believe it. And so they saw Baltimore. And so with Terrence's input, uh, we're here. This is our second one. Uh, we have one more that's going to be in Philadelphia next week. Plans are to not only just have the conversations, but try to gather folks locally to provide some solutions. The other thing that has happened is that people who are from the same parts of town have not connected. And so the goal is we're going to get on the plane tomorrow that you guys who don't know each other will connect because there is no one person who's going to make this thing go away. It's going to take a community to make that happen. And so that's our priority. That's our main focus in doing it. I want to recognize a few people before I pass the mic. Uh, one is Daryl Freeman. If you raise your hand, Daryl. Daryl is from South Philly, um, another area where they're doing a lot of things that people don't talk about. But he's part of our Fathers Incorporated team and is helping to gather information from tonight's meeting as well. Um, the second person is Jen McHenry, which I think she's, Jen is downstairs. She was the person who welcomed you guys upstairs. Um, Nicole Pexton, can you raise your hand? She's with our team as well, um, does a great job of making sure we capture everything that's been discussed. And then Wendy, don't hurt me. Say your last name. Yeah. Say it again. The Brett um, is part of our team as well in helping us to gather information from these people. So our goal tonight is to not be scripted, to not be poetic, but to keep it real. She said, hmm. <laughs> I know that's uh, So that's why we're here, and I'm excited to be here, and hope that we have a good conversation tonight. So, Terrence, you want to take it? Everybody doing okay so far? Yeah. All right. Again, I just want to um, thank you all for coming out really at such a short notice. Um, again, as Patrick said, I went out to Baltimore two months ago when they had the first town hall on parenting in a violent world. And um, it was amazing some of the stuff that they were talking about. You know, and we hear about violence here in Seattle, but, you know, we had one guy that got up and was talking, and he talked about preparing his son at the age of two to where he hear gunshots just, just stop fall and hit the ground wherever it is he's at, you know. And so we, we, we have it here, but on a different level than what they have it in Baltimore. Yeah. And it's so intense back there that sometimes the folks back there forget about up here. Mm -hmm. And so and that's the reason why I wanted to make sure that they came up here. Uh, and that's the reason why we wanted to make sure we passed the mic to let our friends in Washington, D.C. know who's in Seattle doing some of the same work that's happening in D.C. Yeah. and trying to impact their families and their kids. So again, as Gregory said, uh, you guys should give yourselves a hand for being out here tonight on a Thursday night. And so what we're going to transition to now, I want to, uh, my wife's not going to introduce herself, but my wife Heidi and my two daughters just came in from the back. They had a volleyball game. But my wife back there, Heidi Henderson Lewis. And my daughter Destiny. Say hi, Destiny. She's shy. <laughs> And then my daughter, Hadia, back there, she's far from shy. So, <laughs> so what we're transitioning to now is um, we're going to let the panel go ahead and introduce themselves. And we do have a couple of uh, pre-screen pre -screen questions for the panel. But what we want to do is to give a little and learn a little. And so while we ask some of the questions that we already have for the panel, we also want to give you all an opportunity to ask questions for the, from the panel and also to give you, you know, you guys heard of elevator speech before, right? When you get a chance to respond, try to use the elevator speech because if, if everybody decides they want to give a mini sermon, you know, 8 o'clock will become 9 o'clock, 9 o'clock will become 10 o'clock. Okay? So everybody say elevator speech. Elevator, elevator speech. speech. All right. So we're going to start with the panel. Go ahead and give your elevator speech. Introduce yourself. Um, hi, I'm Victoria Thomas, and I am originally from Albany, Georgia. Um, I am a PhD student at the University of Washington working for... Um, Center for Communication, Difference, and Equity. Uh, again, my name is Stephen Michael Thomas. I'm, I represent the King County Prosecutor Attorney's Office, uh, which means that I represent all of you. Uh, I am a, a, when I stand up in court, I say my name is Stephen Thomas, and I represent the state of Washington. Uh, I deal primarily with domestic violence cases. So day in and day out, I'm, I'm on the phone talking with domestic violence victims or talking about issues of domestic violence in court. 
I'm originally from the south side of Chicago, uh, uh, born by uh, and raised on the south side of Chicago. My father's uh, black from the south, from Georgia, from Augusta, Georgia. Mm. Uh, my mother's German, uh, so I grew up in a biracial household. Uh, my dad left my family when I was eight years old. Uh, left me on the south side of Chicago with my mom, who raised me, a white woman raised me in an all-black neighborhood, uh, uh, and kept it real. Uh, took me to a black church, uh, taught me what it meant to be a black man, uh, taught me about the responsibility of being a black man, and I learned that mostly from the people in my church. Um, came out here about seven years ago. My wife and I came out here to go to law school at Seattle University. Uh, my wife is also a, uh, a lawyer as well. Uh, we have a, a six-month-old son uh, named Xavier. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, my name is Davida Briscoe. Um, I'm a mother of five. Um, again, in um, October 2007, mid 2010, uh, I experienced one of the worst tragedies of my life. My Not only did my twin brother go on trial for a very violent crime, but he was sentenced to 48 years in prison. In that same week, that I lost my twin brother, who was a perpetrator of violence against a woman and a child. He was found guilty in that case. In that same week, my son was shot um, during the gang brawl in Tacoma, Washington. Um, before I even lost my son, I had worked with youth, and it, this has been my passion uh, in this community in King County before moving to Tacoma. When I moved out to Tacoma, um, it, you know, that's just when, when uh, I experienced the loss of my brother, uh, losing him to the prison system, and then also losing my son. But I have grown, I grew up in a household where violence was normal. Uh, and, um, and so parenting in the violent world, again, is just a conversation that I have much personal uh, in, in interest in and also have a professional interest. So I usually tell people I didn't even choose this work, this work chose me. And so you know, I didn't ask for this calling. It just dropped on my lap when death knocked on my door. And when I see my twin brother go to prison, but I grew up with my mother being spending 15 years in prison, my father going to prison, my parents being bona fide hustlers. So my whole life was surrounded by drugs, crime, um, and violence uh, my entire life. So, you know, and then growing up and then having a tragedy in my own life, you know, thinking I was the Christian parent and, you know, I did all the right things. You know, was I a bad parent because my son ended up, you know, being shot in a gang brawl? Um, you know, was my brother a bad, is he a bad kid? You know, so those questions came up for me and where I had to really dig deeper to say, okay, what is really going on in our community? What is really going on in our homes? And, and can I be able to answer some of these questions of where I can try to prevent this from happening to other families? Right. Yeah. Let's just keep the mic up here. And so what you, all, what you heard so far from the panelists, does anyone have a striking question that they want to ask first? We have a hand in the back. I don't necessarily like to hear anybody. Can you guys hear yes. mm -hmm. yes. And that's also one of our pre-screen questions to discuss the psychological impact of those childhood experiences of parenting as an adult. Well, I can, I can talk about a recent case that I had, uh, a domestic violence case, uh, where uh, uh, a young man, well, he's not a young man, he's about 47 years old, uh, beat up his, uh, his girlfriend. He'd been dating for about 12 years. He's beat her up on several different occasions. And on this particular occasion, he was at home uh, they were at their house, uh, it was the guy, the girl, uh, it was her mom and her two kids. Uh, and they got into an argument, he knocked her in the face, she fell against the wall, I mean, I, I have pictures, there's blood all on the wall, she slammed down to the ground and she's knocked unconscious. Uh, the two kids are watching this whole thing. Uh, she gets taken out in a stretcher, she gets taken to the hospital, she's got stitches all in her mouth, through her, through her mouth and also in her head as well. So, uh, fast forward. Uh, I'm talking with the, the woman after, the, after this all goes down, 
and she's telling me about the effect that this had on her children. And she says, uh, she has a, 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 I can't mention her names, but she has an older boy, uh, and she told me that this, this older boy was having nightmares, uh, that he was uh, not doing as well in school. Uh, but what really struck me the most was that he, she said that not too long after this, that he ended up slapping another girl at school. And she told me that he now thinks that it was cool uh, to hit on women. So just talking about that perpetuation of that violence, he didn't learn. I mean, he's a, he, he's a, I believe he's an eight-year-old kid. Right. I mean, he, he, he's modeling what he saw. So that's a little bit of, of how I've seen that cycle play out just in the work that I do. Um, speaking to what he was saying, if we kind of think through those effects and we think of a child watching a violence, you know, there's always different reactions in different um, children. I'm noticing girls, it creates... Um, the sense of power, you know, powerlessness. You know, I can't help my mom. Um, and in those moments, they kind of learn that as a woman, their power is not coming through a physical way. So they look for different ways to find their power. And a lot of times that comes out in sexual behavior um, because women are realizing that our power is not coming in these, these physical forms. Mm -hmm. So it does play a huge role in a lot of the relationships um, that they create, especially with men as they move. So when you said what they see, so what do you think about the impact that television, music, uh, media has when it comes to children and violence? Um, well, as a um, scholar at the University of Washington, I'm in the communication department, and I do a lot of research on the media effects of violence, um, as well as in multiple different communities. And I think when it comes to violence in the media, the real issue is not that they're viewing it, is that we don't know quite how to have conversations with them about what they're seeing. Um, we're just not quite sure, like, you know, and how do we approach these conversations and how do we have these conversations. And that's kind of what the um, Center for Communication Difference and Equity is working with. We're trying to kind of figure out how do we give parents these tools to kind of have these conversations about these media things that are happening that they're seeing every day. And I think that's kind of why they become desensitized to it. They don't quite know how to work it out in their mind, like, what does this really mean, especially if I'm eight? Like, what does it mean for me at eight? What is this going to mean for me at 16? So without having their parents or community members work through those conversations with the, them, they're kind of doing it with each other, and their information is becoming just mixed up with all of these images and what they're seeing. I, I think there is a, um, there's a great, there's a lack of,
that they want. They want a tablet, they want a laptop, they want, you know, and I'm getting those things, but I'm not filtering, or he has no strong male presence in his life to help him filter those messages. So, you know, when he's out on the street, and we know scientifically that media increases violent, uh, aggressive behaviors. Absolutely. And, you know, I know Straight Outta Compton just came out, you know, which, you know, everybody said, did you go see the movie? No, I didn't, you know, because NWHB gave us drive-by music, you know, and, it, yeah, they did. <laughs> you know, they, and we know that, you know, violent uh, music lyrics, you know, increase violent thoughts and uh, aggressive, uh, hostile uh, aggression in, in young people. So we know that, that's, that's scientific uh, based. So when my son is listening to all these, the, the music lyrics that he's listening to, I'm just buying him the CDs, I'm buying him auto, Grand Theft Auto, I'm buying him whatever because I don't mind him playing it, but I, at, at the same time, I'm, I'm thinking that if, you know, if I just tell him, you know, Donald, you know, don't fight, you know, don't, don't do this, you know, I'm not training him how to have empathy for other people, I'm not training him how, you know, when they say, be, a woman is a bee in the hole. I'm not telling him, you know, I'm not helping him to filter a lot of the messages that he's, that he's receiving. And so for me, um, you know, when, when, especially the messages that uh, uh, black men are, are America's demons, you know, they get those messages on the basketball court. They get those messages when they go to the schoolyard. They get those messages when they're out on the street and they're interacting with, with one another. And then when they're interacting with the police, the, those messages are being reinforced. So they begin to adopt a criminal code of respect where my name is all I got. So I gotta be willing to die for it and even kill for it. Yeah. And so it's not so, it's, it's the aggressive behavior that's learned or acquired through what they're listening to, but it's also how they begin to view themselves. Right. So that's, that's the issue for me about what, um, how they can socialize and condition through media. And so how do you have, how do and when do you start having those conversations? You see a lot of the younger parents now, and it's like, you know, they're not having the conversation because the kids, the conversation has never been had with them. And so the time they do have that conversation is like you said, when your daughter comes home and you start talking about penis. Where's my daughter? Oh, they're in here. But, so when do you, how do we talk to parents about when to have those conversations? I mean, how many of you in here have kids and started at an early age and was having those conversations about, you know, gang violence, sex, and all those other things? And see, and you're the norm of, the folks that are a lot of the folks that we work with, because they're not having those conversations. Get, I got two hands. I'm gonna get Paul, and then if you guys want to say something. I really um, have to pick up our son for my practice, so we made it quick. Um, I like what you said. You have to you have to stay in the dialogue, and when kids get of age. Particularly, and it's kind of also culturally too, right? We distance ourselves from them. We're trying to give them some space to find their own identity. Um, I think it's, that's, this, there's two strategies that we've used, right? We're former youth pastors, and you know, we uh, we love young people. We have literally uh, inundated ourselves our whole lives with young people, uh, with just young people in general. I have a deep love and passion to work with young. But we, we, we decided to go with two strategies. First, to stay in the dialogue, no matter, uh, and, and to, to be less of someone who answers questions all the time and more of a question asker. Uh, there's an old quote that says, what's more beautiful than the answer is the question that preceded it. We have to allow for them to process these things themselves and stay in the dialogue with them, no matter what it is. Uh, NWA, yeah. We went to see it, and we brought our kids with us, too, right? And part of us, you know, the nostalgic moment of the 90s, particularly here in Seattle, or the 80s, that, that was, like, that changed and, and, and completely changed the youth landscape. We were no longer B-boys. We was gangsters now, you know? And it was, you know, eventually grew in the <laughs> South End City, et cetera. Um, but I think it's important that we, you know, we stay in the dialogue with them. We were able to, to talk to them afterwards and process with them what they were seeing. And, you know, as a parent, it's like, do you give it to them, do you not? You know, we all grew up with nothing, right? And so we want to give our kids something, you know? And so, and then these are, this is, this is 
It's great, but it's, it's a devil. See, the wife said, we in church. Too. It's a devil. Um, but, but to that point, if you don't have the dialogue, this is already having it for them. It doesn't matter if you, if you decided or not. There's so many portals into other things with, with this device. And, and, and so I think it's important. So the second strategy is we start planting planting our God kids and, and the kids we went to youth ministry and that they're adults now. We started to plant those good people in their lives because we know they're not always going to come to us. And so this, the, 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 you know, so far so good, you know. Um, we worry about our son. Like both of our, we have two kids now that, uh, that go to Rainier Beach High School. I'm at the football field with my son and I hear pop, 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 pop. Everyone looks up, and they go back to business as usual. And I'm thinking to myself, is anyone moved by this anymore? And so, but one of the reasons why I'm here is I think, I think it would be helpful for you all and for parents that are dealing with it to be able to, like, what is your strategy? What have you used up until now? Because I think a light bulb will go off for some of us with some of the strategies that other parents are using. And I think the answer might be here amongst us. Thank you. Oh, urban families. Yeah. <laughs> urban family, brother. Urban family. Uh, so I just want to know a, a couple of questions here. Uh, we have a lot of systems here in this room, a lot of systems represented. And um, I don't know if I'm saying this right, but we have kind of successfully infiltrated the system. Um, and I know when we get together, we can talk about the system a lot. But I'm wondering, <coughs> whereas people who are a part of the system, where have we? Where are we falling short? What can we do better? Um, because we're in there. And then I just recognize this is a very powerful room. Maybe a lot of the people we serve are not here. Um, and this is a great parenting class for all of us. But how do we give it to the people? You know what I mean? So how do we want to respond? say that as a representative, uh, speaking for the people that are in my office, I think that we don't come to do what I'm doing right now and kind of listen to what people are talking about, yeah. listen to what people are feeling. Uh, I was actually talking with my friend Zach over here one time about a, a police shooting that happened somewhere. I don't remember where it was. One of the multiple incidents where someone got shot. And as a lawyer, I start going and analyze the situation. Well, well, did he pull a gun or did he do this or do that? Because that's how I think as a lawyer. And he was talking to me about how it felt to him, about the traumatic effect it had on him. And I couldn't really hear that because I'm so caught up in the, 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 you know, the, the legal stances of it. And so I think having that feeling, uh, having that empathy, having that compassion is something that I can speak only for the people that I, that I work with day in and day out, who for the most part are white people. They don't feel that pain. They don't understand that. They can't, they can't, they can't fathom you know, how it could be that, you know, uh, Someone can be as lovely as this woman right here and, and, and have such traumatic things in her family. They've never met anyone like this before, you know? So I think that's a huge thing is just being able to have an open ear and to be able to listen. Because as a lawyer, we love to talk. We love to tell people what they should do. But instead of really listening and figuring out what it is that we should be doing. And so I can only say that that's how we fail. Uh, one of the ways that we failed. I mean, we can. it's a lot of different failures. But one of the things is just showing up and just listening. And, uh, and trying to implement some of the things that the community uh, is asking for and needing and wanting and implement those into some actions. I'll add to that. Um, I think your point around the listening is important because I do believe that even in this context, we represent government, we represent nonprofit. A lot of what we have generated in terms of services is based on folks who've gone to get training. And what is missed is the element of listening to the community. I'll give you one example. Uh, where I live in Wilmington, in, in Newark, Delaware, Wilmington is probably the most urban city in the whole state. Um, the father absence rate, children being raised by fathers in the home, this is data. For black kids, it's about 85%. The 
Did y'all hear what I said? 85%. So one of the main schools where these kids are going, we've had all the banks, credit card companies, are in the same community. And there's a line that's invisible where these people who go to work over here never get touched by violence. Over here, he just described. You hear this in the morning, 7.15 in the mornings. We had a bank that was going to give the school $50,000 to help the kids. And what they wanted to earmark it for was iPads. <laughs> Which is very noble and very nice. But you know good and well that iPad goes home. Guess what? It ain't coming back. So what we decided to do, they asked me to come in and help them distribute the iPads. I said, before we do this, I want to thank you. Hold your check. Let's ask these kids what they need. This surprised everybody. We did focus groups with the kids and the parents and the teachers. They said, sir, we want your check. But what would benefit us more, number one on the list was grief counseling. Are you hearing me? Because the kids, there are two things that the kids are asked to do, and these are, these are from the mouths of the parents. They're asked to get rest and get a good meal before you come to school. These kids ain't getting neither. Yeah. That's probably not good English. Yeah. <laughs> the second thing that they ask for, because they have uniforms, because the kids are going home where the parents aren't there. They're coming home, they play outside like me and my brothers did. You put that on and go to school the next day. Mm -hmm. Well, at a certain age, we start smelling. So the hallways smell like locker rooms. The second thing to get them to learn was going to be the opportunity to have clean garments. So the parents asked for, which they don't have, laundry services. The third thing was the kids, I have kids, I went to college. My fifth grader bringing on homework, I ain't never seen. And I went to school, so their parents were saying they're very much confused when this homework comes home. So the third thing, I hear an amen. The third thing that they asked for was a homework hotline. And so the guy who was going to write a check for 50 grand heard this overwhelming evidence from the community change it and wrote a check for $125,000. The important point here is where we're falling short is we're proposing solutions without asking people who are going to open the service. Right. Yeah. And so the government, our nonprofits, our churches, even in this beautiful facility, we can do a better job of, to answer your question, engaging that population. What I found out in this one example is that the people who knew best what they needed were the people. And the last thing I'll mention, because I can talk about this all day, counting, counting on systems gets us where we are today. That's right. That's right. Ain't nobody coming to save us. So if you pissed off and fed up about what ain't happening, my father would say, do it yourself. And he would add another word in there. Do it yourself. <laughs> so for us, y'all figure the word out. For us, if there is something that is burning in your inside around solving a community problem, if the doors you're knocking on are not answering it, find yourself a circle to actually address that yourself. But it has to be based on the voice of the folks you're intending to serve. So I apologize for going on. I got uh, one here and I got two in the back. Thank you. I, I have two um, comments to make. One um, back to oh, two. Two. Sorry. Um, going back to um, some of the things you said. I, my 19-year-old daughter, which I stated earlier, was, is my goddaughter that I passed the church for months old. Um, and I didn't have a legally report say anything from the mom just literally. Um, but anyway, she is, uh, it's so funny because she'll come and say to me, uh, Mom, I need to talk to you about something. And I always have to take a deep breath and brace myself because, you know, and I was listening to you talk about how when they get older, you want to kind of, you know, let them find their own way. But she Mom, uh, I think I need to start working for you. Oh, okay, dear. You know, it's like, so she comes and tells me everything, too much stuff. And sometimes I just don't know how to process at the moment because it's like, Mom, you know that day you was talking to me? Well, I had tried smoking weed and I couldn't. I, so what, you know, what do you, you know, it's like, what do I say? When you, you're coming to me, it's like, I didn't find out you were doing this or, but, um, so I, I appreciate that communication with her, but yeah, it, these kids are very uh, different this, this time. Uh, my heart, I just want to, I just have to acknowledge you in my heart because um, I'm listening to your story and looking at how beautiful you are sitting there and wanting and willing to help. Um, I, I think about a little bit about myself in a different sense because when I was 16 years old and my first boyfriend, and love so true, I thought, got into an argument with another 
everybody can raise their hand if they've heard of Trayvon Martin, yeah. Michael Brown. Yeah. Okay, have you heard of Devon Ray Davis? He's 16 years old. Um, there is Camille Love, 20 years old. There is, um, I can go on and on and on. I have pictures where I've collected these young people. Devon Ray Davis was 16 years old. They found him shot in the head in the dumpster in Tacoma. It was not featured on the, on the news. Not in the paper. And I was shocked. I mean, I couldn't believe. You mean to tell me that somebody found a child in a dumpster and our community is not outraged? I mean, I don't, there's no marches. There's nobody to holler. There's no action. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I, I just, I was in shock. Then after that, I heard of um, Hector Hernandez, another 15-year-old who was stabbed 34 times by two other teenagers. And this is when I started to say, you know, okay, Am I going to sit around and wait for the system, <laughs> you know, or am I going to, as a parent, get out there and try to figure out, number one, I had to start unlearning some of the stuff that I had learned. So the first year or two, I had went to training after training after training on violence prevention and what are the things that I have to stop doing and what are some of the negative behaviors that I picked up or the germs that I'm spreading around to my children and everybody else, what are some of the negative behaviors that I have wrong beliefs, the wrong attitudes that I have. So first it started with me. And what, what were some of the things that I was passing on to my own children and in my own household? Am I creating a hostile situation in my own home? And am I doing that in my community? I go home and I respect my employer. And I go home and talk bad to my own husband. So it was that type of stuff that I had to start doing within myself. So I didn't have time to wait for the system <laughs> to change. And I know that there are people out there that's going to keep working in the system, but while they're doing that, now i got to get on, on the ground. And I have to start because i got kids every day that's being shot at every day. i got kids that's scared to go home. They don't want to go outside. Or, you know, they think they can't go on this block or they can't go on that block. You know, like, well, all i got to do is go and look for a job. But I can't go. I can't go to that job, Mom. You know, I can't, I can't go on that block. <laughs> Can you give me a ride? So I think the first thing was that these kids had to know that there was somebody that was willing to die for them, like the civil rights movement. You know, is there somebody who's willing to be on the front line that's saying, I am willing to put my life on the line to save you? Because that's what they was willing to do in the civil rights movement. They don't have that today. And today they don't feel valued. You know, that's why they're wearing obituaries around their necks. I went down to Oakland, I couldn't believe it. it was a mom that lost two kids, two sons. And all the kids wear obituaries around their necks or on their shirt. And in my generation, we didn't have nobody wearing it. Or I didn't know any of my friends that, uh, um, or as in grade school, I didn't have anybody that was wearing uh, their friend's picture on their shirt, rest in peace. You know, but are we teaching them how to live? I mean, how can we, you know, how, you know, if everything is rest in peace, rest in peace, you know, they don't know how to live. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I started the McKinney Project number one so that all of the young people that have died from violence from 10 to 4 are actually, violence, homicide is the second leading cause of death for uh, young people between the ages of 10 to 24. It's the leading cause of death for black boys from 15 to 24. It's the leading cause of death, homicide. So I don't have time to wait for the system. I'm getting out there. I'm trying. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm too, and I show boys in the hood. I'm showing them South Central. I'm showing them all the movies so that I can show them where they picked up those negative behaviors and those attitudes. And that way, I just call them risk factors. And that way, I ain't calling them bad or stupid. Yeah. I'm just saying this is the thing that's gonna put your life at risk. Yeah. Just like diabetes. If you keep on putting sugar in your diet and you don't want to, you don't want to exercise. <laughs> you know, that's what the doctor tell them, right? <laughs> so that's what I tell them. You want to you hang around your partners that got, got, got guns? They can actually pick up that gun and actually shoot you. They having a bad day. <laughs> it can happen. Mm -hmm. So um, so, so those are the things that I've got, that I just went out there and just started. And really, I'm just a mom. You know, I'm not, an, I, I don't even call myself an expert, but I'm just a mom. And then I'm also a sister. You know, and not only do I have one brother that's doing 48 years, but I got another brother that did 22 years. So, I mean, this is this is my life, so I have to. Yeah, again, I don't have time to the system. I just I just get out there and I just go. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to all of the panel and for doing this. And um, I also just want to recognize you, Davida, and thank you for your work. I grew up in Tacoma and uh, went to school there in the seventies and eighties, and graduated from the nineties when I left, and uh, saw a lot of. 
So now I live here in Rainier Beach in Wabonte. Um, don't want to talk too long, but I um, want to mention about the issue of just dehumanization of our lives. And it's what the staff was talking about from the prosecutor's office. Um, something that's really struck me and just part of what I've been thinking through and I think would welcome dialogue. You know, you're talking about how the prosecutors you work with, right, just have no idea, right, what actually happens. And, you know, it really had me thinking what I tell my students um, at Seattle University is, you know, it doesn't matter that I have these degrees, that I teach, that I do all this publishing, you know, that I'm a commissioner for our civil service commission. I used to be a city attorney. I know the police chief, you know, all that. When my husband's out there, when my kids are out there, right, they don't know is another black person, right? And what really just hit me and got me started on um, the book project I'm doing, and, and then I'll stop, is, you know, every time we hear something, it seems like in the news of somebody, somebody's child being killed, I just got tired of hearing the narrative, but they were a good boy. They were a good girl, right? Every time they were, it's like, the response, you know, needs to be like defend your child's, yeah. you know, goodness. They're humans, right? The fact that, you know, they're human even if they were in a game. But a lot of them aren't, right? And the fact of the matter that, you know, you don't hear white parents saying that very often. It's like, oh, it's such a loss. We're so heartbroken. It's not, they were good, you know, they were on honor roll. They did this, that. So first of all, just this thing I've been noticing, um, in responses, but something else that really hit me, I went um, to Washington, D.C. for the Million Mom March, Mother's Day weekend. That was my request for Mother's Day. And Maria Hamilton um, out of Milwaukee, who lost her son, Dontre Hamilton, and has been organizing women um, like you around the country. Um, you know, while we were there, part of what they were talking about was not just police and vigilante violence, but it was also this lack of investigating or taking seriously the loss of lives of color in particular. And, you know, I've done a lot of research, but I've heard for the first time that a lot of police um, use amongst themselves an NHI designation. Some of you may have heard of this, a no humans involved type of slang that they use to talk about cases that don't mean, you know, it's like basically a prostitute or a whore in their characterization or um, depending on the neighborhood, people of color, suspected gang related. And, I mean, physically made me ill to hear that, you know, they would use that type of terminology. Even our police chief, former police chief, Norm Stanford, talks about that in the book. This NHI designation, well, you know, then it's like when we triage what you have to respond to, this is an important, right? So then you hear about dump, people staying in dumpsters, you know, people like uh, Michael Brown and others, you know, just laying on the street for a long time, right? Um, but this humanization, and the thing is, dehumanization. You know, these stories are in the news every day, but still, we're so desensitized. And so one of the things I've just been thinking about is, you know, can we change that? Or is that even how we, you know, go about that? I know one thing I've just personally decided is that my work, when someone says something like, well, you know, you can move to Bellevue, I'm like, well, that is not the same to my family. In Bellevue, right? Um, is your family. So, um, and because it's not set up like that, right? Racism, it, racism is not set up for us to win, right? So, anyway, I just say that to talk about like ideas of how, you know, um, if that's, you know, not that that's the only way to go, but really that lack of empathy or even any connection that, you know, we put our child in lessons too. They do little league. Like, we invest in our kids, right? You know, our family. That also yeah. it does seem like we have a problem with folks holding the mic, but just in case, if anybody has a question they want to put on the card, go ahead and put your question on the card. I'll grab that one. One thing that I, I think it kind of speaks to, I think, behind me, something you said about kind of where I'm going, and also something that you said about free counseling. Um, I've had a lot of young men come through my home 
work and where you work so that it becomes, because all of our boys are going through the system, whether they got parents or not. If they're going through the system, we're all touching them at some point, either on the good side or the bad side. So if there's something we can do to have that conversation and put those things in motion, I don't know of anything, there might be something out here, but if there's something that we can kind of think about too, because I think that's a, a lot where it starts. It doesn't matter what we do, they don't have dad and they don't feel, they feel less than, and it's easier to perpetuate against each other and themselves that self-hate, all those things as grown folks know, makes it difficult for us to be black in America. And our boys are just trying to navigate and it's not working. It's yeah. And so Victoria or Stephen, I'm not sure if that's something that either you can touch on because I know you guys are doing a lot of work around domestic violence um, with young girls, and so maybe that's something that you can talk about is how is that impacting So I think that we need to look at some things, issues such as poverty. 
poverty. Yeah. Poverty is a product of violence. Yeah. I don't care what nobody said. I think we need to look at the fact that when you know we were talking earlier about grief and loss, we don't get counseling for nothing. Unless you've been certified crazy and you got to go get some counseling, then you might be mandated to do so. But we don't we don't get grief and loss uh, counseling when traumatic things happen. And we are a wounded people in this country. And we need to acknowledge that. And we do not. We don't acknowledge the fact that we have no history that we can go to school, public school, and learn about. So we have an identity crisis, a self-hatred crisis, and we are missing some major elements in terms of culture and who we are as a people. The other piece I wanted to speak to, and I'm sure other people can speak to the crisis that you're talking about, but it's been that way. When they go to jail, when they call the hotlines looking for help, there's no help on jail. ain't no management treatment. Unless agencies, grassroots agencies, the Black Prisoners Caucus, and other organizations, they go and they minister in the prisons, right? And that's some of the only way they get some help, some semblance of help. But there's no, uh, there's no rehabilitation really happening in our prison system. So they just keep perpetuating the same cycle. And a lot of it is to me as well, poverty Yeah. Because see, somebody got to eat. Somebody got to, like, you got the job, you keep the job doing this, right? Because this is not going to stop. And they're just going to keep cycling our young boys through this system if we as a community don't stop. So I know you said earlier, brother, we got people from all different parts of the government. But we got grassroots here, just like this sister up here's grassroots. This young lady over here's grassroots. I'm grassroots too. But I just have to figure out a way to infiltrate the system so I can get to my people. That's right. You see, because they hold them hostage. Because they. And I'm going to go back to one more thing. And I'm going to let this mic go. Okay, brother? The, the young lady here was talking about young men need uh, their fathers. No, they all. And they moms. I work with young girls, and we have this conversation regularly, devastated by the fact they daddy and don't know what a good man looks like, and makes all the wrong love choices, right? Have issues. The, am I gay? Am I bi? Am I uh, 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 all kind of issues surface from that? So our males and females, they had a mom and daddy to create them. They need a mom and daddy to teach them. Hey, no one teach a man how to be a man. She can show him how to be a good person. She can show him morals and values and virtues. But a man has to be able to teach a young man how to be a man. And so our young women need to see what a good man looks like. And when the daddy ain't present in the home and a young woman has to grow without a father, it impacts her life in such a way, just like it does our young, young boys. And so it's a twofer. You know, they both suffer. That's good. A lot of good information. We got a lot of heads in a little time. So we were talking earlier about the elevator speech, we broke the elevator. Yeah. <laughs> it's working now. So we're going to get everybody to the elevator speech, okay? Uh, now I want to, I just want you to hear my heart. I've been here 22 years. Came from Shreveport, Louisiana. And I moved here because the community was on fire. It was crazy. I lived in an all-black community. Today, I... Everywhere I go, I live, I live in February. I wasn't born in February. But everywhere I go, I'm like trying to meet people. You know, I see you at the Walmart. I can go to Walmart and get some milk. It'll take me an hour because I'm talking. Hey, how you doing? What's your name? Where are you from? What do you say? Because that's what I got from the South. One of the things I wrestle with here is you look how the houses are built. Garage. You open your garage, you go in, you shut. I know all my neighbors. If I go to a football game, I know every kid. I know his mom, I know his dad. And I don't think we really got to be back to the community. Mm -hmm. It's two types of knowing you. People can know me, K-N-O-W. But also you can know me, you know. We got to really start knowing each other and saying, not stop saying no to working together because we really got on the side of us. I mean, this meeting is good. But what are we going to do after this? Are we going to continue to right. meet and talk about our community? Because if not, it's going to continue to happen until we... Do something together. And I'm just sharing my heart because I'm looking for the black community so we can work together. Hi. Um, I'm one of those French workers that's been in the community working um, with women of domestic violence for years because I was a victim defendant. And um, after I became a victim defendant, um, my case was. Released without prejudice because 
because I did all the work and learned how to be a legal advocate and learned how to advocate for myself. Um, and that was back in 1996. Okay, just to let you know, brother, this has been around a long, long time. Um, when, I, when I went to jail, I didn't even know what DV was. I thought it was just fighting. Okay, and, and we still have African Americans who are not educated about domestic violence, murder, rage treatment, anger, and management, the cycle of violence, they don't even, they don't have a clue of what DV is. And now I go into the jails at SeaTac Federal Detention Center, I'm working with women on a regular basis, and Asians, Ukrainians, every nationality you could, you know. And the first thing, that I'm working on is valuing themselves, identity crises, brainwashing. That's what I spend 12 weeks on before I can even get to DV. Grief, loss, um, fixed system issues. And so this is, you know, this is huge. And these are women who are going to get out of jail and go back to their abuser or go back to their uh, homes. So what I just want to tell you is, the work does start with our community coming together and working with our kids and doing academic coaching work and working with black boys who are in the third grade. My first kid that I worked with said, I don't need my daddy to go to Boeing and work as an engineer and buy me all these games. I need him to hear me like you do. Our kids are not being heard by their parents. And we need to listen to our kids as black people. drop dead today, people would say a lot of things. It matters who it comes from. Like people that never really got to know me. My teachers, police officers, and authority would see me as a bad guy. They would think things like, they would think things such as, Donald's dead. Oh, I predicted that. They see me as a gang member, a troubled young individual. The people that actually know me and have been around me for a while will miss me. They would say things like, he cared about us more than himself. He did things for us. He was smart but young. He was somebody I would like to be like. He wasn't there yet, but he was getting there. If only God gave him a little more time, I could say one thing about him. That boy, he had stopped. Rest in paradise, Donald McCain is what they would say. Even though you may have that 
small nucleus of people that are passionate about we want to be heard. When we speak, are you going to listen? And that's really the question to our community because we're working in the community grassroots. Yes. And we're in our communities and we're watching the cotton in the ears. And we're watching, you know, a statement was made about how that, you know, um, when, when you start looking at people and you start sharing things with them, do you really want me in your business? Because if I'm going to share something with you, I'm going to share something with you that's going to make you make a decision, that you're going to have to make a decision and some choices on. And so my, my, my statement is more of, are we willing to listen?
to me, he, he didn't ask me, could you call the prosecutor, could you talk to my attorney? Never once. All he wanted to do was to call me to, to share a memory of his plea. Mm -hmm. And when I walked in that courtroom, he had his head bent down and he was crying. Yeah. He, was, he was weeping so hard. And I don't think he understood the consequences of what he did. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I called the prosecutor and I said, don't sentence him without me being there. I want you to reschedule that date. And they said, ma'am, you want me to reschedule? I said, yes. They rescheduled the date and sentenced him without me being there. Uh -huh. And they did it on purpose. Yeah. And I know it was intentional yeah. because they did it for another mother who couldn't be there and they did a teleconference from her and she lived in Florida uh -huh. so that she could face her son's killer. But they didn't do that for me, and I live right there in Tacoma. Yeah. So the trauma that he experienced, number one, not only did they go outside the standard sentence range, they went higher and gave him more time, which I was going to come and ask that he get the lesser end of the sentence range. Not that I felt that he should be, go free, right. but I felt that he should get the lesser end of the sentence number one, because he cooperated, Number one, because if he did not hand over, they would not have even connected him to that crime. He could have walked away with it. They would have never known he did it. Mm -hmm. And because he did that, I felt that he should have gotten lower in his sentence rate. But they didn't take into account the trauma that he was experiencing as a person who shot his own friend. Right. You know, that didn't even matter to them. The only thing that mattered to him was, was, to them was that they got another score on the book. Right. You know? He's gone. He's gone. He's out of here. And so, yeah, and, and then they went to him and told him if he even tried to appeal it, that they would, they would charge him with other shootings. Yeah. Um, so, so he didn't even try to appeal it. I mean, but that stuff, no, they don't, they don't care. Mm -hmm. Can I just say, say yeah. something? And, and right before you say something, we got a few more hands I'm going to do. I got one here, one there, one there, one there. That's going to be our last witness. And then we're going to close with the panel. Let's close the remarks. Uh, Patrick will be the last person on the panel to make a closing remark. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we'll have Gregory Davis. So that's the trauma that my daughter had to deal with. 
And my baby, she couldn't even deal with noises because of all that was going on. So I had to isolate her, ourselves for three years just to get her able to get out into the, you know, go out until she can deal with stuff. So there is some problems in our justice system to where, and in our community, to where we look at these young men, our black young men, as being aggressors all the time. They're not always aggressors. I'm not an aggressor. I, do, I don't beat up on women because I watched my mom and other women go through that. I, I despise that kind of stuff. It's not right to do that, you know, to hurt someone, and it's not love, you know, which a lot of people seem to get confused. But my, 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 my thing is, is there are young men out here who are, who are trying to avoid those situations, who wind up restraining or whatever, going to the system. Even my little cousin was getting a phone call from the girl while he was in, in the county, and they was um, recording it, and he got extra sentences because she called him. So the system is not set up to protect black men in the, in the GD. It's just another way to get some brothers locked up, unfortunately. Are you seeing that in the Are you seeing that in the courts now where there are more reported uh, cases of males being uh, victims of domestic violence? I, I have about have one case where it's a male who's a victim of domestic violence right now. It's an older man, he's about 80 years old, and the woman's about 50, and she kept him in the house for two days, beat him with broomsticks and, and, and all kinds of different stuff. Uh, it's just kind of a really Outlier, but for the for the most part, I would say most of the cases I have are mostly women. Uh, it's very very few cases that deal with men. But I would agree that uh, when those when those cases do come along, it's sometimes you you you're wondering who you know who's the uh, who's the aggressor and who's not. That's really a question that it really uh, comes up often. So I really commend you for having the restraint and having the knowledge to know that man. Even if I tried to restrain her, that I might be the one that's you know, ends up being charged with the crime, which is unfortunate, but that's that's kind of the way that it happens. So I think that you had the, the self-control to be able to do that, but not everyone has that. And so uh, I think that you do get people uh, who get caught up in a system who should not be there. Uh, but it doesn't take away from the from the fact that there's a lot of people in the system who should be there, right. you know, who do beat on women, uh, who do uh, uh, commit violence against our, you know, sisters. You know that is a reality, so I don't want to. I don't want us to forget about that. Yeah. That that is a real thing that I day, I deal with day in and day out. Are women who are being abused by their intimate partners, and their kids are watching it, and their kids are learning from it. Yeah. I mean that is a reality. So. Oh, I think we did close remarks. Hmm. Um, I just want to acknowledge the brother as well because I've talked to many many men on this is violence hotlines where they were being abused and they had called the police and they were being emasculated because it's like, you're supposed to be a man. So why you need to call us, you need to be able to handle that. But but in this state, there are, this is a women and children's state, and the laws that are in place does make it very easy for men to be prosecuted for domestic violence, whether they're the aggressor or not. And working with young women, I see a lot of very violent, pissed off young women. And they don't mind putting paws on people. And I'm talking about men, and other girls, and they do it on a regular basis. So that's why when I do the work that I do in the schools and the community that I do, is we're trying to reduce violence. We're trying to prevent violence. We're trying to help them understand, like, you got to communicate better than that. Because they don't mind putting them calls on teachers, students, family members. They don't mind doing it. And they do it on the regular. And the coldest part about it, which we haven't really discussed, is how the media plays a role in that. Because they don't mind. Y'all seen them videos where they beat the snot at each other? Walk up to the somebody's door, and as soon as she opened the door, she's getting beat. Yeah, they do that. Yes. And so that's an issue. You see it happen. Had a situation last year. Um, senior girls getting ready to graduate, and they come through the course really well. Um, they text and put it on Facebook. We're about to get it in. And 40 kids were missing from three of the surrounding schools, Rainier Beach, South Shore, and South Lake. They were in the back of the school fighting. A couple of my seniors didn't get to graduate. Why? Because they had to get it in. When they had been doing the restorative justice and making amends and figuring out how to deal with their issues without violence. So violence is, and, and it, it is a part of this society. We need to just wrap our brains around it. We live in a very violent country, right, that, that don't, don't have, they don't, we forget gun control. We, we about our guns, and violence is what it is. But I think that our community, we 
we take a big hit in terms of the fact that every time there's something that happens violent, we're the, we're the poster child for violence. Like we're the only ones committing, committing crime and, and being violent. The next thing I wanted to say is this, and I'll be really quick. Um, the men, we are black women next to Native American women um, have the most uh, rates of domestic violence homicide nationwide. So, so we know that women do die from domestic violence more than, than any man has in this, in this country. But we do know that women are violent.
think it was important for Patrick and them to hear that, um, which is why we did it this way. Uh, they did it a little different in Baltimore, but I think what you guys had to share is, gives him enough information to take back to uh, Washington, D.C. and share that there are a lot of things that's happening in Seattle and that Washington, D.C. should be a part of what's going on in Seattle. And, and I think uh, uh, Stephen said earlier, he put out Dan Saddleberg's email address. We need to get on our computers. We need to make sure that we're sending emails about things that's going on, things that we're concerned about, questions that we have uh, uh, want answers to. Uh, and as well, Patrick will give us to the, the email to the White House I think it's fatherhood.gov, but he'll speak more about that so that we can have the information so that we can send in questions and answers uh, for stuff that's happening in Seattle. Thank you. Just closing remarks? Yeah, yeah, just give some takeaway. Okay. Um, I guess, I don't know, I just kind of want to piggyback off of what uh, Heidi was saying and um, that academics is the most important. I, I agree that academics is, is important. Um, I believe education is all the different things that kids need that we think are um, important. But a lot of times I'll say education is not enough. You know, history and culture is not enough. Um, opportunity and good intentions is not enough. Um, a lot of times we say if they just give them a job, we just give them education, that'd be enough. But a lot of times we give them jobs, we give them education, and they still get to the campus and start selling drugs when they get there. So, you know, to me, uh, um, you know, the biggest thing is, is, you know, we had the saying, you know, you can take the boy out the hood, you can't take the hood out the boy. It's it's what is it that has gotten into their system? Yeah. You know what it, what beliefs, what attitudes, what negative behaviors, what negative messages have they adopted and bought into? And how do we deprogram that and get them to adopt new values? And some of those new values is number one is that there's nothing more valuable than the individual's life. You know, change begins with the individual. Yeah. They have to want that change, self motivated change. And so, I don't know, um, but, you know, one of the, the biggest work that I do is not just uh, commemorating the lives of people that, of the young people that we have lost. Um, I don't want these kids to be nameless and faceless, because pretty much they are. Um, you know, if they're black and brown, if they die from a, um, a, a, tr a, a gang violence or from drug-related crimes, they're just unremembered and unnoticed. And, um, and because we associate that with them being bad, so they deserved their death some kind of I don't know what that's about, but this senseless uh, death and our and our collective silence and inaction and apathy is what bothers me. We can go all the way across two countries to New York and everywhere else to protest about pro racial profiling and and everything else, but when we, when we have kids in our own neighborhood that are dying and being found in dumpsters, we just again the pop pop pop. We just we don't even respond. And, and, and that angers me. I'm sorry. It just angers me. And so the, the, the biggest thing that I'm doing with the, or my aim with the McKinney Project is, number one, is to commemorate these lives, put a face to the problem. If I continue to put these children's faces, because they are not all bad kids. We have kids that are straight A students that are being murdered and found all over the place. Right. And what are we doing? It's just another kid that just got killed. He's probably doing something he wasn't supposed to be doing. He shouldn't have been in that alley. What was he doing at 3 o'clock in the morning? You know, that's the first thing that we say. And I think if I put a face to the problem, if I keep if I keep showing you these faces, um, you know, and, and I've gotten support from Pete Carroll from A Better Seattle, who said, I don't want to talk to the mayor. I'd rather talk to some moms that want to get on the ground. How much money do you need? So I leave with a check to do the work that I'm going to do. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into these schools, I'm going to go into institutions, and I'm going to try to do, I'll do exactly what the lady goes, she left. Um, mm -hmm. Helping them to understand aggressive behavior, helping them to um, understand empathy and feelings and anger management. All this stuff I had to learn <laughs> myself. And so I said, well, I can get the ground running and, and do it and before they, they leave the institution. And from somebody who has experienced those same type of things, that they're not just a mom, but other young people empowering it. I would say that uh, there was someone earlier talked about, and I think it might have been the gentleman at the end, uh, uh, talked about that it that the, the movement has to come from the people themselves. Mm -hmm. And that if you wait on the King County Prosecutor Attorney's Office and the criminal justice system to change, you're going to be waiting a very long time. Come on. Uh, because it is a slow process and it is a slow go. And so I would say that, uh, you know, that movement has to come from what you guys are doing. That's amazing. I mean, that's really going to make some radical 
say that you know I, I am a member of this community and I work in that system. My goal is to be to, to listen, to be heard, and to share your voices with those who are in power uh, to let them know. I, didn't, I mean, I, I've never heard the story about this young man that was found in a dumpster. I mean, that hurts my heart. You know, I want to go find out who this is, who that is. And, I, and those, those stories need to be shared. And so uh, I, I would hope that um, that you, you know, it's unfortunate that we feel so alienated from our systems and so uh, uh, separated from them because they are your systems. You pay for them. They come from your taxes. I mean, you pay my salary. When I stand up, like I said earlier, I represent the state of Washington. I represent everyone in here, but yet it's not reflecting the vision and values of the community. Yeah. So where is that disconnect yeah. coming from? Yeah. So uh, you know, the last thing that I have to say is that you know the difference, and I'm raised. I didn't. I didn't have a dad who raised me, but it was other people that stepped up, you know, to make me who I am today. Other mentors and other leaders in the community stepped up. And so I just, I, and, I, and I know that that's what's happening here, and I just want to encourage you to continue to do that because that's why I'm here. That's why I can stand up and, I'm, and I can say I'm an attorney versus saying that I'm in jail uh, or dead. Um, it's a huge part of the community that helped to support me. And so I just appreciate just being invited here. I appreciate, I mean, I learned here more than, I, I learned more than I feel like I had an opportunity to share. Uh, it was really more, I'm educated. Uh, I'm built up. I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing in this room. Um, so I just thank you again for uh, for inviting me to come. Thank you. Um, so I just want to kind of close um, with a little bit of my personal background. Um, so I am from Georgia, and um, so I grew up in a household with both my parents. Um, but my sister was a victim of sexual assault at the age of 13 by one of her teachers. Um, and I was in that school as well, so it was during that time that I kind of first learned a little bit about violence. But it was, you know, that hush hush violence, right? Nobody ever talked about it. I knew something was wrong. Mama would be crying all the time. My sister didn't want to go to school. Then I, I would go to school and I would get bullied and told that my sister was a bad person, um, ruining our teachers' lives. And so that's kind of how I came to like learn about violence. And nobody ever talked to me about it. So when I started college, I made the conscious choice to go to therapy for myself. And I've been doing that ever since, and it's kind of, it's like we consider ourselves, how do we help our kids through this trauma, but have we helped ourselves yeah. first? Wow. Yeah. So the very first thing I did was I had to start helping myself before I could help any, anybody else. And I have four nieces, as well as a nephew who were growing up, you know, in the same, the same things, right? So I was like, I have four nieces. My sister was a victim of sexual assault. How do we protect her kids as well as our nieces, right? And I realized that we had to start talking about what we had so we could get in touch with what we were going through, what that meant for us before I could even understand the trauma that may come from what's coming. So, I mean, I do recommend that everybody, if they feel like there's some type of trauma that they're still trying to work through, to, to, to seek those open spaces where you can. Because it makes you a little more vulnerable and it makes you able to open up to the kids in ways that they can see too. That you experience the things and you share with them. And once you start sharing with them, they will share everything. Like she said, they will share, share, share. <laughs> so thank you all for being here today. That's real. Um, I was, I'll close first by just, again, thank you, Terrence. Y'all give my hand for one more time. <laughs> for being a real champion. Yeah, and right before you say that, do me a favor, because when you called me, I had to call the mayor, and we didn't acknowledge the mayor, Gregory Davis, earlier. Because if it wasn't for Gregory Davis, a lot of you guys wouldn't have got emails, and we wouldn't have got this space. And so another person who champions uh, the city of Seattle and the Raider Beach community, uh, let's give Gregory Davis a hand. So it's, you know, to be noted that you have brought us from the east out here to uh, Washington State. That they, personally speaking, this is a conversation that is personal to me. Um, I grew up in a home where my father was there and left when I was 15. And so for a kid who professionally now is a social worker is doing this for a living, this is personal. Um, I remember paydays where the check was short and him taking it out of my mom. I remember days where him being drunk and wanting all of us to do all sorts of things to make him feel better. I remember that. And so for me, this is part of the solution. Uh, in my life where turnaround was possible, 
there were three things that I attribute to that. And I know that there are a bunch of broken people out here. When I say out here, I mean in the world. Um, for me, it's three us. One of those is my faith. Um, I've walked into many prisons. I've walked into many communities where men are broken. And those that find salvation, when I say salvation, I mean change, is part of that has been their faith. The second element that, to me, is personal in my life is my family. When I say family, I'm a Patterson. It may not be a Patterson. It could be someone that cares about me, who I call family. And then the third thing, this points to something she spoke about, um, I think is a word that we didn't mention, but is key, is forgiveness. And not only forgiving you, but forgiving myself for some of the things that we've done. And so as we continue to go from place to place, to have this conversation. Our hope is to continue to hear, but also to share what we've learned. Um, I'll close by saying this. If you want to stay in touch with us um, on um, the web, our email address is info at fatherhood.gov. Info at fatherhood.gov. If you're on Facebook, you can find us at fatherhood.gov as well. <coughs> and the same on Twitter. Um, everything that we're reporting goes back to Washington, D.C., and then eventually gets to the White House. The goal is not for them to profile that we're doing Work, but it's to create a space for change. And so I just want to commend you each for being here on the school night. Um, I want to thank again Terrence and his family for hosting us and just continue to encourage us each to stay together. I believe that not one of us can do this, but it takes all of us to make this change. So thank you again. Um, so how many of you have um, taken a trauma-informed care course or been oriented? trauma-informed care, okay, that's good. So one, one of the tips that it talks about is you don't ask the person what's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. You ask them what happened to you. Right. And one of the things that that's gonna require is for us to take time to, to kind of have our lives interrupted mm -hmm. to, to take that time. I know that's a challenge because I look out here and see you. Each and every one of you, I know you're doing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten things. You got, you, you got a list. There was reference earlier about well, what we're going to do tomorrow. Fear not. These brothers and sisters are going to be working tomorrow. They're going to be working on the issue, working on the challenge. And I know that. I know that. And so I just want to recognize you and acknowledge you all for being here this long. There are a couple other people I do want to, to recognize. We had some media going on in the house tonight. Um, and I want to thank uh, Tiara Tom Thompson for our photo photography. Let's give her a hand. She's provided proof. She's provided proof of the photo. That's yeah. Is here. I also want to thank uh, Ken Gilbert here. Um, yeah, we can call. Ken is a uh, social media tech for Rainier Beach Action Coalition and, and one of the brain childs behind our Freedom Net program. And so what he was actually doing was live streaming through Periscope. Mm -hmm. And so we're using social media in our organization to train young people to use it on the positive tip so they can change the perception of their neighborhood from the inside out. Mm -hmm. And so that program is called Freedom Net. And so thank you, uh, Ken. Um, I'm going to put my brother on blast. He told y'all that he was retiring. So if anybody's looking for a board member, my man, Earl. Earl. <laughs> I threw him right here. <laughs> Don't forget to, to take you up on, on that. Um, and I'll just say that uh, we are having our re uh, restorative justice um, planning committee meets uh, in this building on the second Tuesday of every month. So our next meeting is October 13th uh, at 6.30. And like I mentioned earlier, we are um, looking to bring restorative justice, peacemaking circles to um, this neighborhood uh, because we do realize that is one of the ways to kind of impact this uh, violence. And so what I'd like to do is just leave you um, here today with, a, with this uh, proverb. And you know, we talked about the challenges that, that we experienced. We talked about the dehumanization and, and how we need to s switch that. And so I, I I'll just say to you, just because a log is in the river a long time does not make it an alligator. Okay? So thank you very much um, for um, gracing us with your presence here, hanging out with us for this long. Um, we extend blessings to you um, and just want to thank you again for the work. Uh, keep, keep, keep moving, keep moving, keep moving. All right, good night. <laughs>